got going on here at Calvary Chapel. Um, we got a women's Bible study on Saturday mornings, 10 a.m. We've got the men's Bible study at Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. And for those of you who have kiddos, uh, we meet uh, Wednesday nights at 7 and Sunday mornings at 1030. And for the uh, children, uh, it looks like next this coming Wednesday, make sure your children bring uh, backpacks uh, ready for their crafts. They need to wear their tie dyes because they're going to be taking pictures. Now, it's this Wednesday. So they need to have their backpacks, their tie dye, and the crafts that they're going to be doing for this Wednesday. And it uh, looks like they're going to be taking individual photos, is what it says. Okay, and uh, this morning, Psalms 119, verse 111 says, I have inherited your testimonies forever, for they are the joy of my heart. Let's go ahead and open in prayer, and we'll get uh, Brother David up here to bring the message this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, and we just thank you for allowing us to be here this morning and to meet together in, in, in this beautiful building for church and fellowship. And we just ask that you put your presence on Brother David as he brings us the message this morning. And we ask that you just come, open our hearts and open our minds so that we can receive this message. In the mighty name of Jesus, we say, amen. Amen, church. Let's stand and let's get ready to praise this morning. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters and to mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Your grace is enough for me. Your grace. 
for his grace is enough for me and for you. Jesus, we just thank you. Church, y'all sing with me. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. Yes, Father, for you are here. You are here. Faith can move the mountains. Let those mountains move. We come with expectation, waiting here for you. Yes, Jesus, we are waiting here for you. Waiting here for you. You're the 
Nuestras manos alzamos al rey. Te adoramos, Señor. Cantamos. Let's just sing waiting here because we are waiting here for him. Waiting here for you. With our hands lifted high in praise. And it's you.
will be by your side Cause I never want to go back to my own life I need you more More than yesterday I need you more More than words can say we just give you the highest praise Father that it should be more than the breath that I breathe God that we should lift you up in this time right now Jesus it's more than the air I breathe more than the song I sing more than the next heartbeat, more than anything, and Lord, as time goes by, I will be by your side, and I never want to go back to my own
let's just praise him right now. Come on, we just give you the highest praise. continue to praise him right now. Just continue to lift up his name. Father, that our praise is worth so much to you, Jesus. Father, that our praise is just going to be lifted up to you right now. Father, that we just focus on you right now, Jesus. Focus on your love right now, Jesus. More than the air I breathe, more than the song I sing, more than the next heartbeat, I need you more. And Lord, it is time. I will be by your side Cause I never want to go back to my own life We just thank you for your presence. We just thank you for just coming out. Lord, Father, I pray that you just be with David as he gives the word, Jesus. I pray that your Holy Spirit is just flowing through his veins right now, Jesus. Father, that somebody in this house, God, can just open up their minds and heart right now to receive what you want them to receive, Jesus. Father, for your word is living and powerful, Jesus. Father, we just thank you. Come on, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I didn't know if you was finished or not. I need you more. I need you more. I don't know how many times y'all have heard me say that I need Jesus more today than I've ever needed him in my life. The moment I get to where I think that I've gotten there, I need to check myself. Pastor Albert is in California on a conference. And he's asked me to bring the word today. I want to tell you a little story about a man named Bill who lived in California. He was a college student. Very intelligent man. Very smart man. Bill wore old raggedy t-shirts. and Old raggedy beach shorts. Never wore any shoes. But he was smart. Top of his class at the college. And one day, one Sunday, he saw the church across the street from the college. Real nice, prominent church. Everybody walking in, nice suits, clothes on. Bill says, you know what? I'm going to go to church. So he takes off, and he goes across the street, and he goes in the church. The church has already started, and they're worshiping God, and they're carrying on, and Bill looks around, and there's not any seats, so he just gets, goes down the middle of the aisle, and he's walking down the middle of the aisle, and he looks around. He don't see any seat. Well, finally he looks up, and he throws the pulpit. pops down on the floor right there in front of the pulpit starts worshiping God. Well, about that time, an elder, way back in the back of the church, he's on a cane, he's got a nice suit on, he looks real good, hair all combed. He sees Bill sit down in front of the pulpit, and he takes off with his cane, headed for Bill. 
And all he could hear was that cane hitting the concrete floor. Dip, dip, dip. And all the congregation are watching the elder. They're watching the elder and they're watching Bill. They're watching the elder. They're watching Bill. I said, man, he's going to get him. He's going to get him. He's going to get him. So Bill finally makes his way all the way down to, uh, the elder finally makes his way all the way down to where Bill is sitting. And he lays his cane on the side and he plops down beside him. And he starts worshiping God right along with Bill. And before the pe- preacher could start preaching, he got to the pulpit and he looked down at Bill and he looked down at the elder. And he said, the message I'm about to bring you, you might forget. But the message of love you just seen in front of me, you never will forget. You know, Calvary Chapel is just like that. Calvary Chapel will meet you exactly where you're at. They don't care what you look like when you come in here. We don't care how you come in here. We, you can come in here as tore up as you want. We're going to set you on the front row. That's the same way God looks at each and every one of us. The minute you think you got there, you need to check yourself and start again. I have to check myself daily. Paul says I need to take inventory constantly and check and make sure I'm in the faith. There's a young man. Many of y'all that come here on Wednesday night know that we have a group of young men that live down the road here. And the state takes care of them. It's a state-run house. And uh, they come and they eat. And sometimes they'll sit halfway through message and then they'll leave. Each one of them has a little thing that they're working with. Each one of them. My favorite one is Mervin. Mervin will come walking down through here real quietly with his hands in his side. He's just walking, looking at the ground. And he'll see me. And he'll say, hey, hey. And I'll say, how you doing, Mervin? He says, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And I said, that's good, Mervin. And Mervin will say, you know, you know, one of these days when I get right, I'm going to come to church. I'm going to come to church. Mervin doesn't have to get right to come to church. You don't have to get right to come to church. I don't have to get right to come to church. When I'm at my worst is when I need to be sitting right there. When I can't deal with myself is when I need to be sitting right there. You see, I'm a sinner. I guarantee you, right now, if you stuck your hand out, you're going to touch a sinner. If you stuck your hand out, you're going to touch a sinner. If you stuck your hand out, you're going to touch a sinner. If you stuck your hand out, you're going to touch a sinner. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm a sinner. The day that I think I've gotten there, I need to check my relationship with God. When Albert asked me to preach... I said, Albert, I usually don't like to come behind him because Albert is a deep teacher. He digs deep. And I'm not that deep. My mind don't go there. I can't dig in that deep. But I felt like God was asking me to pick up where Albert had left off. And I went in his office and I said, Albert, I think, I think I'm supposed to bring a message right behind you. And he smiled. And he said, go for it. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to bring you the message that God gave me. I'm going to ask that you open your Bibles to the first book of John. And we're going to start in chapter 2. Is, uh, you see this? This is my new grandson. He was born last night at 1045. My son called me yesterday morning. Thank you. My son called me yesterday morning at uh, 530. He said, Dad, Lois water broke. We're headed to the hospital. Man, I jump up and I get together and I take off and I get to the hospital. The wrong hospital. Sat there 30 minutes. Son, where you at? Oh, we're driving around the hospital trying to find the... the I said, it's right here, son, right across from uh, 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 Tractor Supply. Tractor Supply? What do you mean? Dad? Where you at? You're at the wrong hospital. I said, oh, man. So I had to get... I got over there finally. Well, at 1045 last night, this little guy came into the world. And this little guy, I hate to say it, was born with the same sinful nature as you and I. The same sinful nature as you and I. We're going to learn that today. 
what sin is and what it does to us in our life. Separation from God. You want to turn to your Bibles, like I said, 1 John. It's 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The first thing I want to talk to you about is that word, little children. Tikineo. That is the word in Greek. It means infant or newborn. John is talking to fairly new Christians in the faith. John is talking to a church that isn't well established. And evidently, there's men have crept in there and brought in Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is where they, 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 they proclaim the deity of Christ but not the humanity of Christ. So John writes this letter to set them straight so they won't follow that, so they won't grab a hold of that. He says, so that you will not sin, so you will not be separated from God. Sin is separation from God. John says, I write this so you will not sin. Uh Uh-oh, I went the wrong way, did I? Oh, man. I did go the wrong way. Sin. To be without a share. To to miss the mark. To be mistaken. To miss or wander from the path of unrighteousness and honor. To do or go wrong. To wander from the law of God. Violate God's law. Sin. Nobody wants to talk about sin. Sin. No preachers want to talk about sin. Nobody wants to hurt your feeling. Nobody wants to tell you you're doing wrong. Nobody cares. Nobody does. Nobody cares. Paul says, if there wasn't no law, I'd never know I was sinning. If I have a kid and I never tell him, no, you can't do that, he's never going to know not to do that. So the law is good. It brings forth our sin. It keeps me from wandering, from straying. From getting too far from God. Sin takes us too far from God. John says, I write these things that you may not sin. So, where does sin come from? I'm sorry these are a little small, but I've made them myself. I did this myself, this presentation myself. Genesis 2.1 And the Lord God commanded the man. He didn't say, man, you might not want to eat at that tree or you might want to watch out for that tree or I'd stay away from that tree. God commanded the man. He said, don't do it. Don't do it. Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely. But, but, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. You shall surely die. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. That ought to tell you something right there. That ought to tell you something right there. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. Yet, we want to grab a hold of him. We want to say, I'm there. I'm with you. I'm there. That's okay. I'm in. We want to listen to him. It tells you right here, he's more cunning than any of us. But we grab a hold of his lies. We grab a hold of his teachings. The beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of the tree of the, of the every tree of the garden? So right now he's playing on words. He's throwing lies at her. How many times does the devil lie to you? Trick you? In a minute we're going to learn that Eve says, The devil deceived me. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But, there's that word again, of the fruit of the trees which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, she knows, there's no excuse, there's no way out, she admits it, God has said, I know. Many of us know exactly what we're doing when we step over into sin. Many of us know exactly what we're doing 
when we turn our back on God. She knew too. She's going to blame it on the serpent. Then the serpent said to the woman, uh oh, I think I left some of it out here. Then the serpent said to the woman, Did the Lord say that you shall not eat? or you will surely die. He's playing with her mind here, the same way he plays with this. For God knows that the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God. So, the woman saw that the tree was good. Let me tell you, the devil is a liar. But he has convinced this lady that that fruit was good to eat. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eye. How many of us fall into that sin? How many of us see something with our eyes, and we grab a hold of it? Another woman, another man, a drink, a shot of dope, whatever it might be, it comes from us. I'm my own worst enemy. I go into prison, and I tell these girls and these guys, I said, you are your own worst enemy. You can't blame nobody but yourself. You can't blame the devil. You remember that old saying, the devil made me do it. That's a lie. He might have presented it to you, but you still got to grab a hold of it. You still got to run with it. I'm my own worst enemy. I got nobody to kick but me. I got a friend, he's out there right now living in sin. And he breaks my heart, but there's nobody for him to beat up except himself. We've got all the power that Christ has laid on us. We've got everything that God has given His disciples to stand up and say, get away from me, devil. You have no hold on me. I'm a child of God, and I received that. And then look at it. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. So many times... We get in our sin. We want to share it with somebody so we don't look so bad. We want to share it with somebody so we can say, well, they did it. They got nobody to blame but me right here. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together to make themselves coverings trying to cover up their sins. That's what we do out of nature. Try to cover up their sins. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Can you imagine? Can you imagine having that much fellowship with God that He's walking in the garden with you, that you you can reach out and touch Him? But my sinful flesh has ran me away. i got to hide my face from God. Can you imagine how Adam and Eve felt? I had it all right here. Many times you and I have it all right here. away and they heard the sounds of the Lord and God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord separation from God my friend then the Lord God said behold the man is one of us the man has become like one of us to know good and evil You know, we just read that the man's eyes were open. You know, have you ever thought about that? That his eyes became open? Have you ever seen a horse wearing a pair of pants? Or a monkey wearing a pair of pants? He don't know that he's naked. There's no sin in that. He doesn't know that he's he's naked. He doesn't know that he, 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 he doesn't have any clothes on. His eyes are shut to the fact that there's even a sin in that. But our eyes have been open. Our eyes recognize, oh man, I've got to cover this up. God has opened our eyes to sin. 
Then the Lord the God, then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And to now and now, least he put out his hand and take of the tree of life and live forever. Thank you, Jesus, for what he's fixing to do. Do you realize what would have happened if that man and his sin would have got a hold of the tree of life and ate it? We'd have been cursed forever. We'd have never been we'd have never had no hope. If he would have got to that tree of life, you and I would have been stuck in this miserable body from now on. We'd have lived forever in sin. But God says, Therefore the Lord sent him out of the garden. Away from me. Away from me. So the Lord God sent him out of the garden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man. And thank you, Jesus. And he placed a cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every which way to guard the tree of life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm proud of the new life that God has given me. You see, Eve was driven away by her own evil desires. In James 1.13, he says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. My heart. I get the I-isms. I need this. I want that. I like this. I want that. I-ism. I'm driven away by my own evil desires. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. That death is separation from God. The second death is total separation from God. Jesus said that you and I, if your heart is in Christ and He lives inside of you, if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, we will never taste death. We will never test the second death. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to learn about our advocate in a, mo- in a minute. Do not be deceived, my brothers. I put this scripture up here because a lot of people say, you know, I, I don't think Jesus works. I don't think God works that way. Why in the world? This is after Jesus held, has healed the man laying by the pool. Uh, I think it's at Bethesda. Is that I say that right? Bethesda. He, he, he tells the man that you're healed. Your, your faith has made you healed. Get up and walk. Pick up your mat and go. And he takes off. And, and a little bit later, Jesus sees him around the temple. And the, and, and, and the Pharisees are telling him, Hey, where are you carrying your mat? You can't carry your mat. Today's the Sabbath. You ain't doing no work on the Sabbath. What's wrong with you? And then he says, Well, that man healed me. And he told me to pick up my mat. And then he goes on, and then Jesus comes into him. Jesus says, Jesus says, afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. See, you have been made well. Your faith has healed you. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. What in the world is he talking about? What in the world is he talking about? I'm going to tell you what he's talking about. I'm going to read this. We're going to go on a little bit. And we're going to get right back to this. But I'm going, to, I'm going to pick up right here where we was at, if I can remember. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He didn't say anything about you being righteous. He says, you have an advocate. The word advocate means summoned, called to one side, called to to one's aid, one who pleads another's case before a judge, a pleader, a counselor of defense, legal assistance, advocate, one who pleads, okay, uh, interceder of Christ. You know that same word that's here, if you look it up in the Greek, it's the same word that speaks of the Holy Spirit. Huh? Huh? Same word. 
Jesus said, if I go, the Father will send you the Holy Spirit. He will send you an advocate. He will teach you all things. He will show you all things. He will give you courage. And all Him, that's, that's where I get my being. It's the Holy Spirit. An assistant of the Holy Spirit destined to take the place of Christ with the apostles at their ascension to the Father to lead them to a deeper knowledge of the gospel truth and to give them divine strength needed to en- enable them to what is that? undergo trials and persecution on behalf of the divine kingdom. A lot of preachers will tell you that Jesus is in heaven, heaven pleading your case. I'm to tell you I don't think Jesus is in heaven pleading your case. He don't have to plead your case. If you're a Christian, you've been covered by the blood, and he stands before God, and he said, that one's mine, God. That one's covered by the blood. You see, he's already done the work. There's nothing you can do. You're a sinner. You've got to hit your knees and say, forgive me. Father, I've got an advocate. And he stands before me. And his name is Jesus Christ, the righteous. In Job, Job says, Job is the oldest book in the Bible. How many people know that? How many people know that Job is the oldest book in the Bible? Way back before Moses, way back before Abraham, Job writes. Listen to what Job writes. Job writes, although there is no violence in my hand and in my prayer and in my prayer is pure, O earth, do not cover my blood, nor let there be a secret place for my cry. Even now, my witness is in heaven and my advocate is on high. My ancestor is my friend as my eyes pour out my tears to God. And he condemns with God on behalf of man as man pleads with the friend. Way back then, no preacher, no teacher, nobody but Job sitting in a field with boils on him, his skin falling off of him, lost everything he had, then his kids, his flocks, everything's lost. He says, i got an advocate on high standing before the Father to plead my case. Each and every one of you have an advocate on a high. If you're a child of God, if the Holy Spirit lives in you, you have an advocate. Romans 5, 18, and I don't know how this got here. This is way before where I want to go. I'm going to stop right there. I told you I did this myself. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit more about another man. So sin is disobedience from God and separation from God. I want to talk about a young man. If you would, if you turn to your Bibles in the book of Job, I mean uh, Jonah. Let's look at Jonah's life. Jonah was a prophet of the Lord. Anybody know who Jonah is? A lot of people say that book is fictional. That's a myth. Let me tell you, you look back in the book of Matthew, and Jesus is talking to, his, to the Pharisees, and they want a sign. They say, show us a sign. He says, you wicked and, and evil generation. He said, the only sign you're going to get is a sign of Jonah, Jonah, who was in the belly of the well, the belly of the fish for three days. Jesus talks about Jonah. I tell you, this story is true. Every single bit of it. Is everybody there? We're going to go through Jonah, and I'm going to read it. I didn't put it up on the board because I had to go. I got called to the hospital. So anyway, um, before I read that, I want to. I want to read a little bit here. I want to tell you a little something. Uh, what happened? Uh, you know, Pastor Albert talked about fellowship the other day. And that, that word fellowship, fellowship, that word is koinonia. 
It's a Greek word. It's koinonia, and it means fellowship, association, community, communion, joint participation, intercourse. That's not the same kind of intercourse you're thinking about. This is talking about working together. This is talking about weaving together. This is talking about becoming the body of Christ, okay? That's what this is talking about. The share which one has in everything. Fellowship, intimacy. Do you have that intimacy with Christ? Do you have that intimacy with Christ? Jonah lost that intimacy with Christ. Let's go on here. I'll find it in a minute. Everybody there? I'm going to pick this up and I'm going to carry it with me because I don't have, it's not up on the board and I apologize for that. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Now the word of the Lord. The Holy Spirit wants you to know that this has got the word of the Lord has came to Jonah. Arise and go to Nineveh that great city, and cry out against their wickedness that has come up before you. Nineveh was the hugest city of its time. They say the walls were a uh, 100 foot thick, uh, tall, and you could race two chariots around the top of it. It was just huge. It was huge. And they were ran, it was ran by the Syrians. The Syrians were the worst and wickedest people that you could meet. Outside the city, they just piled up heads. And they'd take the bodies and they'd stick it on a stick and they'd stick them down side the road. So when you came by, you'd go, "Woo! I'm passing this place up. They were wicked people. They also raided Jerusalem two or three times. They came into to Judea and carried off people. And when they would come in, they'd kill all the men. They'd rape the women and then kill them. Jonah knew this. He had had some of his family done like this. Jonah says, I'm not going. I'm not going. But Jonah said, but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. Now let me tell you this right now. Jonah had allowed his sin, his hatred, to drive a wedge between him and God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Many of us, Drive that wedge between us and God over smaller things. Jonah had a reason not to go. They were wicked people. They kill you. But you and I sometimes drive that wedge out of our own evil desires. Our own evil desires. Joppa was about 500 miles away. It was a little port on the edge of the sea. And Tarsus was about 2,200 miles away on the other side of Spain. He's trying to get as far away from God as he can. Sometimes you and I think we're trying to get away from God. I tell the girls all the time when I go into prison, I tell them all the time, I said, you know what? If you're drinking, if you're getting high, if you're shooting dope, if you're lying, if you're cheating on your husband, if you're doing that in the closet, it don't matter. Because when you step out, you're still a drunk. You're still an addict. Do you understand? I can't hide from God. I might get out of the will of God, but I cannot get out of the presence of God. Do you understand that? I can get out of the will of God, but I cannot get out of the presence of God. Jonah, just like some of us, we think we can. And he went down to Joppa. He went down to Joppa. Notice that. He went down to Joppa and found a ship to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. You see, Jonah had walked away from the Lord and immediately... He starts going down, 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 down. Huh? How many of us have said, I'm going to do this on my own. I got this. Within a month, we're on our knees going, God, get me out of this. How did I get here? What is wrong with me? How come I'm not trusting you like I was? On his way down. 
on his way down. He's going to get further than that, we're going to find out. Verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. And there was a mighty tempest of the sea, so the ship was about to be broken up. The ship was about to be broken up. Remember a while ago? Jesus said, go and sin no more. At least something worse happened to you. Huh? Huh? You tell me God won't spank you. God will spank you and set you on your butt and send you off back to school. I guarantee you He'll shake you up like you ain't never been shook up. When I come out of prison, when I come out of the drug rehab, I had it in my mind that after the law quit watching me, I had it in my mind that after everybody quit looking at David, I was going to go home and shoot dope again. And that's what I did. God let me run wild for about a year and a half. Every day, I'd pass that Bible on my counter at the house. And I'd look at it and I'd keep going. Every day, I'd pass that Bible on the counter at my house. And I'd keep going. God got tired. He yanked my butt up and he set me on one of them hot bunks right there in prison. That's where I got my heart right. That's where I said, you know what? I need you. I need you more now than I ever had in my life. That's when I quit playing around with God. That's when I got my heart serious. God will shake you up. He will cause a storm in your life like you ain't never seen. Something you can't get a hold of. We're going to find out that these are mariners. These are men that made their living on the sea and they're scared. They're scared to death. Why? Because it's a spiritual storm. It's a storm they ain't got no control over. It's a storm of God. And when a storm of God comes in your life, you ain't do nothing but hit your knees. That ought to be the first thing you do. Shaking in your boots, you ought to hit your knees. Then the mariners were afraid. And every man cried out to his own God. His own God. And they threw the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten the load. How many times? We lose everything in our lives. We lose everything in our lives because I want another woman. I want a shot of dope. I want to drink beer. We lose it all. We throw it all overboard. But Jonah, what do you think Jonah did? Huh? Huh? But Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship and had laid down. Jonah had gone down to the lowest parts of the ship. What is the Holy Spirit trying to tell you? Huh? He's at his bottom. You would think, wouldn't you? He's not at his bottom. But you would think. He's in an old, cold, musty, stinky ship that leaks and smells and got rats. He's laying there in his sin. He's so comfortable, watch it. He had laid down and was fast asleep. Mm, mm, mm. We get so comfortable turning our backs on God and walking in our sin. We can lay down and go to sleep. Don't even bother us. Don't even shake me up. Until we realize the storm is raging all around us. So the captain come to one six. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise and call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And then they said one to another, Come let us cast lots that we may know for who caused this trouble has come upon us. For whose cause this trouble has come upon us? So they cast lots, and the lots fell on who? Jonah. Everything done in the dark is going to be brought to the light, my friend. Just like I said, you can go home and shoot dope in your closet, but when you come out, you're still an addict. You're still an addict. Everything you do in the dark is going to be brought to the light. They then said to him, this is 1-8. They then said to him, these are the mariners. These are the mighty men. These are the men that have been selling the the seas all of their life. They're scared. 
Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And what do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what and of what people are you? I'm a Christian. And I've walked away from God. And he's kicking my butt right now. That's what Jonah tells him. He says, I'm a Hebrew. I'm a child of God. So he said to them, I'm a Hebrew. And I fear, and I fear the Lord. The God of heaven who made the seas and the dry land. Evidently, Jonah's fear of the Lord wasn't as big as the fear of the Amicites who was over there, the Syrians. He wasn't, he wasn't scared. He, he was scared of them. What can you do to this body? He hadn't gotten to that point yet. What can you do to this body? Then the men were exceedingly afraid, uh, One ten, and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So John had already been shooting off his mouth. Man, I'm getting out of here. God's on my tail. I'm out of here. He can't find me. Let me tell you, don't put God in that box. Don't put God in that box. I've done it, and I've done it, and I've done it, and God shows off every time. I say, God can't do that. Well, show me. Every time God shows me. Don't put God in the box. God tells you he's going to do something. You say, I'm watching. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Jonah had put God in a box. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more temperate. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for, become calm for you. For I, know that this was, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Jonah says, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Is that not what Christ has done for every one of us? Did not Christ lay down his life for us? That's what this is a picture of. Jonah saying, my life for yours. The same thing that Jesus did for every man here. And woman. Christ has done it for us. I can't do anything. He's already done it. The only thing I have to do is accept him into my life. I have to accept him. You know, the last time I was on this pulpit, I taught, taught out of uh, John 3, uh, John 3. 3-1, I think I started there. And anyway, I talked about being born again and how the Holy Spirit comes inside of me. And I forgot what I was going with that. Excuse me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's nothing that I have done. I have been cleansed by what Christ has done on that cross. He says that if you believe in me, that you shall receive eternal life. That belief is an action. James says that even the demons believe and they tremble. Just because I believe don't do me any good. I got to put it to action. I got to let it grow inside of me. I got to walk it out. I got to be about it. I can't just talk about it. The Holy Spirit inside of me leads, guides, directs me, teaches me how to leave as Christ. I should be glorified with Christ. In a minute, we're going to talk about that. I should represent Christ in everything I do my mouth, my actions, my walk, my life, my love. It's all for Christ. What do you think he says? Lay down your life. Pick up your cross and follow me. Come on. You can do this. There's a scripture in here. I didn't get to it. But it says, I'll get back to it in a minute. Let's go on. And he said to him, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea Continue to grow more tempest against them. What is this a picture of? This is a picture of me trying to do it on my own. This is a picture of me trying to reach salvation on my own. This is me trying to get it by works. This is me saying, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. Guess what? I can't do it without Christ. I can't do it without Christ. I can come in this church and I can sit in that chair every Sunday, every Wednesday. I can read that book all I want, but until I've accepted Him into my life, and put that belief into action. I'm doing nothing. I'm doing nothing. This is a picture. Of trying to gain salvation upon yourself. One 
114. Therefore they cried out to the Lord. You know, that's a big L. Is it a big L in your Bible? You notice that's a big L? That's our Lord. You see that? They're believing Jonah. They say, we see you. We believe you. We feel it. They cried out to the Lord. Some people were saved here. Men read right over that. And they cried out to the Lord. They're crying out to our God. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. And do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as you please. You know that God does as He pleases in my life. He allows you to run around and do whatever you want to do. But when He gets ready to snatch you up, He's going to snatch you up. When He gets ready to set your butt in jail, He's going to set your butt in jail. God holds all creation within the palm of His hand. And that means my little life. I thank you, Jesus. For all that you've done for me in my life. So they picked up Jonah. And they threw him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And offered a sacrifice to the Lord. And took vows. They took vows to our God. I don't know how they offered a sacrifice. I really don't. They might have made it in their vows because they're on a ship. And I don't know how they did that. Now the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord, get this, now the Lord had prepared a great fish. It doesn't say well, it says fish. The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now that's in Jerusalem, in, 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 in Hebrew culture, you had to be dead three days and three nights before you were legally dead. That's why it's so important that they tell you that about Christ. He was dead three days. That way they want you to know he's dead. That's what this is a picture of. Jonah's in the belly of the well, the fish, excuse me, for three days. A picture of he's going to be delivered. Now, oh, let's see. Then Jonah went in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Did you, did you see that where it says, Now the Lord had prepared. Just like when he spanks you, just like when he shakes you up, he's going to prepare, prepare deliverance for you. Do you understand me? Do you hear what I'm saying? Can I hear that? Amen. He's going to get you out of it. He says, I love you enough even though you're sinning, even though you're over there drunk, even though you're shooting dope, even though you're acting crazy. He says, I'm going to give you a way out. I'm going to show you how to get out of that. God loves you that much. He loves me that much. He has rescued me from the gates of hell and allowed me to walk across the threshold of grace and mercy. He loves each and every one of us that much. It's nothing that I've done. It's nothing that Jonah's done. This next part is big. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. 2-2. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my afflictions. And he what? And he answered me. God's word says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. No matter where you're at. No matter what beer joint you're sitting in. No matter what gutter you're sitting in. No matter what ditch you're laying in. You cry out to God and I guarantee you you're going to find out He's right there beside you. You might get out of His will, but you can't get out of His presence. I cried out to the Lord God because of my afflictions and He answered me. Out of the belly of shallow I cried. I believe that's hell. He's saying out of the midst of it I cried. And you heard my voice. Three, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea. 
for you have cast me into the deep. God will shake you up and don't let nobody else tell you He won't. He loves you enough to shake you up. He loves you enough to set you in jail. You heard Pastor Albert stand right here and say, I'll pray you into jail if you're after acting a fool. Sometimes that's the best thing for you. You need to get shook up. You need to get clean. You need to get your mind off that dope so you can get straight and get back with God. For you have cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the floods surround me, and your bellows and your waves pass over me. Man, Jonah, all them years ago, knew about the messed up life today. You get out there and you get to swimming in your sins. You see if you don't feel like you're drowning. You can't get your head right. Nothing's working. Nothing goes right. You lost everything. Jonah knows exactly what it's like. He says, you cast me into the sea. The waves are over me. He says, I went down to the mornings of the mountain. He's gone to the roots of the mountain. He's on the very bottom of the sea. You can't get any lower. Jonah's Jonah's gone down, 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 down. Now he's on the bottom of the sea. The roots of the mountain. I believe the NIV says the roots of the mountain. Here he says the mornings of the mountain. The earth that is bare closeth behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord. Two seven, my soul fainteth within me. I remembered the Lord. Let me tell you, when you get down to that last little nibble, you get down when there's nothing else to hold on to. Everybody's walked out on you. Everybody's left you. People don't answer your phone calls. Nobody wants to see you. You're out on the streets. You got nothing to hold on to. Oh, but Jesus Christ. My Lord and Savior, He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He says, Then my soul fainteth within me. I remember the Lord, and my prayer went up to you in your holy temple. I want you to look at this. 2.8 it says, Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. I do it to myself. That's what he's saying. Is that not what he's saying? I do it to myself. I'm my own own worst enemy. I can't blame it on nobody but me. I need to turn that I-ism around. And it's my fault. I did it. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I'm going to give you all praise, God. I'm going to give you all praise and glory in my life. I do every morning. I thank Him every morning. I say, God, just thank you for all that you've done for me in my life. Without you, I'm nothing. Without you, I know where I'm at. Without you, I'm shooting dope. Without you, I'm just worthless. I thank you. I give you all praise and glory. Every morning, I give it to Him. Every morning, I give Him that. He deserves it. That's what He wants. He wants that fellowship. He wants you saying, I need you in my life. When I get proud and I'm walking around, I'm I'm good. I got money. I got a good looking woman. I got a new motorcycle. I'm good. Tell you how far away you are from God. That pride will smack you down. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pray what I have vowed. I will pray, pay what I have vowed. What have you vowed? Have you asked Christ into your life? Have you said, I give you my life? I give you my life. I accept your son into my heart as my life and Savior, as my Lord and Savior. Have you done that? You know you need to keep your vow? Do you need to walk that out? To live it? To be about it? To share it with others? The best thing I can do in my life is share my salvation with somebody else. Share my joy with somebody else. When that light goes off on them and they say, I get it. I want to set them into my life. Tears run down my eyes. As I 
has seen the work in my life. I pray that I will, I, I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is from the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish. What do you notice right there? Huh? The Lord spoke to the fish. He has control over that fish now, doesn't he? The Lord spoke to the fish. And he vomited Jonah out onto dry land. My friend, you and I owe everything we got to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to try to find these scriptures if I can. There's that cute little guy again. This is the one I was going to show you a while ago, I think. Did I read to you about Cain? I wanted to show you this one about Cain. So the Lord said to Cain, we all know that Cain, he, he, he took a bad sacrifice to God. He took him what he thought God deserved. Isn't that what most of us do? Most of us put in the, put in the thought that we want. We give God what we think he deserves. Our tithing, oh, well, here's a 20. That's good for you, God. You know, Here's my actions. Oh, well, you know, I went and fed the homeless. That's good for you, God. Cain did the same thing. He brought God a bad sacrifice. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your continence fell? In other words, why, why are you all mad? Why are you all down? Why are you all sad? Will you not be accepted? No, let me back up. And why has your continence fell? If you do well, if you do well, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Accepted by who? There's only Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. Who else is going to accept him? God. God is there. God says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin. Sin. Separation. Lies at the door. And its desire is for you. It wants to control you. It wants to have you. It wants to have its way with you. It wants to ruin your life and everything in it. I'm not scared to preach about sin. I'm not scared to tell you I'm a sinner. I don't live in it. I don't walk in it. Romans 5.18. Romans is one, Romans is one of my favorite books. Romans 5.18, this is going to tell you, this is going to tell you that, that you and I can't do anything. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm being saved, and I will be saved. What does that mean? What does that mean? I'm saved. I'm being saved. And I will be saved. I'm saved by what Christ has done on the cross. Does that make sense? That's justification. Sanctification comes by what I do by the Holy Spirit. I'm walking it out. I'm living it out. I'm being about it. I'm being about His business. I'm sanctified. I've set myself apart from the world. Do you understand that? I don't get in their business. I stay in mine. I sanctify myself. The Holy Spirit leads, guides, and directs me. I hope He leads, guides, and directs you. I hope He's the biggest part of your life. Without the Holy Spirit, I'm nothing. And then glorification. I will be saved. When Christ comes back, it tells me, the Bible, God's Word tells me, that I will see Him for who He is because I will be like Him. I will be glorified. You know, matter of fact, if you think about it, let's read this. Therefore, as though one man's offense uh, judgment came to, to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification. That's, we've been justified. Ain't nothing you can do. You can say a hundred thousand Hail Marys. Ain't going to do you no good. You've got to be justified by Jesus Christ. Been re result in justification of life. Romans 5, 19, For as by one man disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. 
Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. He says the law came so that you can recognize that you're a sinner. I've got some grandsons. When they see me coming, they say, how you doing, Papa? Yes, sir, Papa. No, sir, Papa. They tell their mama, no, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You know why? Because I laid down the law to them when they were little. I said, you're not going to talk to your mama like that. I spanked their butt just like God does you. He needs to spank your butt sometime so he can put the law on you so you can say, you know what? I need to act right. I used to take them boys in Walmart and they'd fall around behind me like a row of ducks. They'd never touch nothing. I've had little old women come and say, boy, them boys mind mine good. I said, yes, ma'am, they sure do. Because they know I'll whop their butt. The law's good. Some of us need to, to teach our kids. Some of our kids are running wild, running crazy, doing whatever they want. And when we, want, we, we, we say, well, I don't know what's wrong with him. I'll tell you what's wrong with him. He didn't give him no upbringing. He didn't lay out no law on him. You allowed him to walk that way. Does God allow you to walk that? No. He'll shake you up. So as sin reigned in death, even so grace might have ran through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Whew. Man, it won't go back. I think they're messing with me up there. Not up there, up there. Who himself, listen to this, there's nothing you can do. I've told you, I've preached it, I've preached it. You know, I used to think in, in Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 10, 26, am I right, Bill? Hebrews 10, 26 says, if you continue to sin, after you knew better than sin, I don't know the exact word, but it says, if you continue to sin willfully, there's no sacrifice for you. I used to think that you could lose your salvation. But then God slapped me on the head one night, and I realized I didn't do anything to gain this salvation. I can't lose something that was given to me freely. That he's not up there with an eraser scratching me off and then writing me down and then scratching me off and then writing me down. He doesn't do that. You're saved. You're being saved. And you will be glorified. You better walk it out. He said, go because you have been made well. But sin no more. At least the worst thing come to you. I want you to realize that. You don't want a spanking? Get your butt right. Get your butt right. For He bore our sins, yours and mine, on His body, on the tree, that we have died to sin. I can't stand sin. I can't stand it. I don't want to watch a dirty film. I don't want to hear nobody talk that way. I don't want it. I don't want it in my life. I'm dead to sin. I don't need it. It's stupid. I hear people talk, man, and you get, man, man, devil's all over you, boy, and you're a Christian? That we have died to sin and might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. By his stripes you were healed. A lot of people pray that over you when you're sick. Oh, by his stripes you heal, you're going to be healed. That is not what he's talking about. It's not what he's talking about. He's talking about salvation. You gain your salvation through his whipping. You gain his salvation through his beating. You gain your salvation through the nailing on the tree. That's what all that's about. It's not about your cold or your cancer. He might, he might heal that, don't get me wrong. But that's his will be done, not my will be done. I can't heal you. He does it. For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. My job on this earth is to glorify Jesus. Every walk, every breath, every action. And I slip up. Sometimes I think a stupid thought. Sometimes I say a stupid thing. But I don't live in it. I don't continue it. I don't do it on purpose. I hit my knees and I say, Lord, whoo, help me. I'm a sinner. And he says, this one's mine. This one's mine. 
Who, whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. You know, you hear people say, oh, we're all children of God. We're all children of God. We're all children. Let me tell you what. If you ain't a Christian, you're, you're a child of Adam. Did you know that? You're a child of Adam. If you're not a Christian, you're a child of Adam. Scientists has proved that all things point back to Adam and Eve. All things point back to that man and that woman that God made. All of our generations point back to there. If you're not a Christian, you're a son of Adam. You're living in sin. It isn't until the book of John, I think it's 1.14, that John says that all of him believe on his name. He has given the right. He has given the right to become children of God. It ain't until then, until you accept him, until you start walking it, until you start living it, that he gives you the right to become a child of God. I thank you for my inheritance. My friends, you and I have been clothed in righteousness. When God looks down and sees me sinning, He doesn't see me. He sees the righteousness of His Son. You and I have been clothed in righteousness by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask my prayer team to come up here and we're short on time. But I want my prayer team to come up here and I want you to realize if you've been going through some things it don't have to be sin. You don't have to be getting drunk or whatever. If you want to receive Christ come up here and talk to one of these people. If you've been going through some things in your life and you would like some prayer I'm going to ask you to just come up. Is Cece here? Has Cece left? Cece, can you come up and play us a song? She's going to play a song. I'm going to pray for us real quick. But as these people are up here, don't give up this opportunity to come up and get prayer, please. You know, I can't do this on my own. You can't do it on your own. I'm going to pray. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for all that you've done for us, Father God. I thank you for each child here. I thank you for the work that you're doing in each one of our lives. Father, I pray for that one that's out there that's lost, that's struggling. Whoever, Father God, I pray that you bring them up to the front and let us pray for them. I thank you for all that you do in our lives, Father, and I give you all praise and glory. And help us pick up our cross and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. I need you more. More than yesterday, I need you more. More than words can say, I need you more than ever before.